Good evening. Welcome you to Concord Baptist Church tonight. And we're going to have kind of an interesting little uh, get together tonight. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 65. But before we go there, let's uh, have a word of prayer, if we may. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word. God, your word is precious to us because through it we learn who you are. We learn who we are. And we understand what you are doing in our lives. And so, Lord, there is so much in our lives that we are needing you for. We need to depend on you for everything. And so, Father, I pray that we might look at uh, our relationship with you in a way that brings about a holy awe about who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Our psalm tonight is Psalm number 65. And this is a psalm that was written by David. And actually, the next two psalms are psalms of praise and thanksgiving. They are worshipful psalms, and they were saying at different times uh, by the Jewish people, they were saying something around the clock, around the, the calendar, I'm sorry, uh, through the year. Uh, but in particularly, they were uh, done in the harvest time. And so they were praising God and thanking God for all those things that were going on and all that God had done uh, for them as a nation. And so David uses this as an illustrator about how that God had brought him out of the deep, dark times in his life. And he could look at those times and understand God moving in his life, even though it wasn't a pleasant time for him in his own uh, journey. But it starts out here in verse number one. It says, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. I'd like to just do a little bit of a chorus here. And then we're going to pick back up now, would you please? song kind of that way. He says, praise waiteth for thee. You know, there is a time when we praise God. There is a time when we lift him up in praise and worship and adoration. But when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about the time whenever 
Moses was in the desert, had ran and separated himself from the people, and Moses was there, and all of a sudden there was a bush that was burning. And Moses turned aside to see the bush that was burning, and yet was not consumed. And the voice that came to Moses was this, Take the shoes off your feet, Moses, for the ground wherein you are standing is holy ground. You know, when holy God arrives, it's holy ground. I don't know how many times you've been in a worship service where the presence of God is just so overwhelming that there is a holy hush in the place. God's magnificent power overriding the spirit of worship in a magnificent power. Listen, those things don't happen by accident. They happen on purpose. And how do they happen? They happen whenever God's people wait on God. I think so much in this hurried world that we live in, in this time that we live in, we get in a really big hurry for everything. We want, we want everything concise, short, to the point, and moving on. We're all like that. We, we, we've learned that that's the lesson of our, of our time, is that. And we have lost the art of waiting before God. To just take the time to open our heart and our mind to God in a way that honors Him and brings praise and glory and just to stand silently. And then, you know, we remember what the Bible says. It says, be still and know that I am God. Well, for you to do that, you have to stand still. That means you're going to have to give up on your timeline. You're not going to have to worry about what, how long you've been or what you've been doing, but rather is God speaking. Listen, if God isn't speaking and God isn't directing in our lives, we're not getting the full benefit of the worship that God offers to us. So we have to learn to wait on Him. And that's what the psalmist is talking about. He's talking about waiting on God. He's talking about praising and celebrating God. He's talking about lifting his voice to God to say to God, I love you, I praise you. I lift you up because you are the one who is truly worthy of worship. Then he says something else here that is of significance in starting this psalm. He says that his vow will be performed. You know, we make a lot of promises to God in our lives. Sometimes we do that when we're in stress. Sometimes we do that when things are good. But we, we make promises to God. I remember that whenever God called me to preach and God laid, I believe, his hand on me for that purpose, I remember that I, I prayed and I asked God to just uh, take over in my life. And I promised him that I would serve him for the rest of my life and that I would give him my best for the rest of my life. But then, you know, events happen in life, don't they? And sometimes we lose our way. And I have to tell you that there was a period in my life when I felt like my ministry was over and I lost my way for a while. But the precious power of the Holy Spirit kept reminding me that that wasn't true. That the calling that God placed on my life and the agreement that I made with that calling was not for a short time, but forever, for the existence of my life. You see, God knew whenever he called me and God knew whenever he laid those things on me that I promised him that I would do, that there were going to be some heartache along the way. He knew there were going to be burdens. He knew there were going to be overwhelming times. He knew I was going to fail. He knew I was going to fall. He knew I, he knew I was going to walk away for a time. 
He knew all of that. But it did not change anything that God had promised. What have you promised God? What is it that you have promised God and you were sincere before God and you, you said you were going to do certain things for God and now you've gone back on those things? How about whenever you got saved? You know, you came to the place in your own life where the burden of sin was so heavy and the charge of sin was so heavy and the life that you had inherited as a result of that sin was heavy and it was a terrible, terrible rock around your neck and it was dragging you down and there was no sadness and no joy in your life. But the one day you saw the truth of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and you saw the sovereignty of God Almighty and that he performed for you that which you could not do for yourself by going to a rugged cross and dying on that cross that you might have life in him. And you came and you knelt at an altar or maybe you knelt at, a, at your bedside at home or maybe uh, you you knelt at a pew, wherever it was, and there you made some promises to God and you gave him your life and you said, God, I give my life to you 100, complete, completely give it to you. It's yours. I've made a mess out of it and God, I need you to fix it up. And so he fell under the majesty and the sovereignty of God and there we found repentance and faith and we found all the things that we would ever need for our lives. And God gave us the earnest of our inheritance in the person of the Holy Spirit to come live in us. And we got up and we left that place wherever it was and there was great joy and anticipation and excitement about what God was about to do in our lives. But then somewhere along the way, problems began to come. There were attacks on our faith. There were those who did not understand. There were all of these things. And gradually, we started a drifting process. And we walked away from God. That's what David has said. I made some promises to God, and I am going to keep those promises. You know, when you think about it, God made promises to you, didn't he? He promised, he says, all who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I, Jesus, God Almighty, will give you rest. Take my peace upon you and learn of me. For my burden is light. You see, God promises some things to us, but we have made promises to God as well. God has never gone back on one of his promises ever. But that isn't true of us, is it? And so David says, I have made some promises to God. I have made some promises, and those promises that I made to God are vital and those promises that I made to God are, are important in my life and they are the guiding directors of my life and I am committed completely and totally, totally and wholly to God. I will do what I promised no matter what. And so we have to come to this place where we honor God by keeping our word as he has honored us by keeping his word to us. It's a two-way street. So David says, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to keep that which I promised God. What is it that you've promised God that you're not doing? Well, it's not too late to change, guys. All you have to do is just turn the page. Go back to doing the thing that you promised to do before God. Go back to worship. Listen, 
you're not going to be able to worship God as you ought to, and you're not going to be able to wait before him and have that holy hush in your life until you get rid of the thing that's creating a block between you and God, and that block is sin, and sin is not keeping the vows that you, kept, that you promised God. So you've got to go back. Notice what it says in verse 2. O thou that hearest prayer. Jesus promised to hear our prayers. Sometimes we get to the point in our lives where we have our own concept about what that looks like in our lives. And he says, unto thee shall all flesh come. God is a sovereign God and the creator God of all that is. He is the one to whom we plead. He is the one to whom we cling to. He is the one to whom we address our need. He is the one who sustains and fills us and sanctifies us by his own power. He hears our prayers. You know, I was uh, talking to some other pastors today, and as I was talking with them today at a meeting that we had, I mentioned that one of the things that I struggle with, and we all do that, is terminology. Somebody uses a term, and we think we know what that term means. Well, we certainly know what that term means to us, but do we really know what they are saying? I had a great professor in college, and one of the things that he taught us right off the bat was know the term and know what the person means by using that term. Because what they use and say may not be the same thing as you understand it to be, and you may take it to mean something that it does not, in fact, mean to them. So you need to define the term. So when we start talking about God and prayer, we need to define the term. What is a term? It's very simple. We open our heart and our life to God in all honesty and sincerity in a spirit of worship, holding nothing back. And we say to God, God, I need you. And God says, I'm listening. I'm hearing that. And that's what David is saying here. And thou that hearest my prayer. Nobody is going to get anything done in this life until they come to you, holy God, to get what they need. He talks about this here in verse 3. He says, Iniquities prevail against me, and uh, as for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. See, we need to talk about redemption. There's only one who can redeem us, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to come to the place in our lives where we understand what God is doing in our lives. We have to come to the place in our lives where we understand the application of God's blood on our lives and that takes away those iniquities and takes away our sin and brings us into a place wherein we are cleansed. We see all kinds of symbols in that in the worship service that was done in the first covenant that the priest had to go to the basin and wash his hands while he was doing the ceremony of offering up the blood of Jesus, uh, the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. There was a washing involved. There was a cleanness that was involved. Listen, guys, the only one who can make you clean is Jesus. No one else can do that. You can't make yourself clean. And certainly no preacher praying over you can make you clean. And no church can make you clean. Only the blood of Jesus that was given for you on Calvary's cross can actually make you clean. Nothing else can. Aren't you glad that God forgives us? Aren't you glad that God has offered himself for us 
and I'm told we don't understand the depth of that. In an untold fashion, we don't, we don't get it. And we never can. I think sometime when we get to heaven and we look and we see what the Lamb of God did for us, we will do like the Bible says, we will fall at his feet and we will cast our crowns at his feet. We will fall on our face because of the magnitude of all that God has done for us in forgiving in us. He has provided for us a salvation that is sure, that is complete, that you and I can rest upon. Notice what it says in verse 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach thee that he may dwell in thy courts we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Well, I'll tell you what, there is a whole lot in this chapter, this verse here. We could camp out on that the rest of the night, but let me put it to you this way. I don't know why God chose me. I don't know why God spoke to me. I don't know why God offered his salvation to me. I don't know why he did all that. I don't know how that happened, but I do know this. He did so, and I received that which he asked of me, and in doing that, I became his child. I was not the initiator. Jesus was. Jesus spoke to me first through the power of the Holy Spirit, and God called me first, into salvation and calling me into salvation, he made me his own. I don't understand the width and the height and the depth of all of that, but I know it's true. Now notice what else he says. He cleansed me by his own blood so that I could approach him. So that I could come to the altar of grace where the Bible says we can find help in time of need. I don't come to God as a stranger. I don't come to God as one whom he does not know. I am his child. I come to him. He knows who I am. He knows my address. He knows my heartache. He knows my sorrow. He knows my grief. And he welcomes me into a place of communion and intimacy with himself that I don't deserve. I don't know about you, but that simply blows me away that he would be willing to allow me to come into his presence, into his courts with my petitions in a loving fashion, not as a guest, but as his child. God has provided for us something that is greater than any that we can ever know. And he says this, we have his goodness, his goodness displayed toward us and that we're able to go there. We are not satisfied with our goodness, can't be. Have to be satisfied with his goodness. It's the only way. Listen, it's the goodness of God that brings you to repentance. It's the goodness of God that brings you to himself. It's the goodness of God that puts you in his courts. It's the goodness of God and the favor of God that makes your life what it is. Without that, you're pretty much on your own. And you do the best you can and that doesn't even work well in most cases. And then he talks about his house his holy temple. Listen, I, I, I'm going to get real, real personal here. I believe this. God has created a house for which we are to worship in. And if you're really God's child, if you really belong to him, I don't think you can step out of God's house and stay out indefinitely. I don't think you can do that. I don't think it works. I know that whenever I got away from the Lord, I was in the Marine Corps and I was doing some things there that were occupying my time. And 
I got to the point where I didn't, didn't go to church. I got to the point where my Sundays were uh, filled with other things that Marines do. But you know what? Every Sunday morning when it was church time, it was like there was a steeple bell ringing in my head. I knew I wasn't where I needed to be. And one day, one of my staff sergeants in the company that I was in said, Bob, I want you to come to church with me on Sunday. Listen, God never leaves us alone. And I went with him. And God touched my life all over again. Listen, guys, you can't absent yourself from the house of God and the people of God and the place of God and where God says, come and worship me and live as God would have you to live. That's breaking the promise to God. David wanted to worship God. He wanted to worship God in his holy temple. And when he was absent from that place, he was grieved. It was not a place that he wanted to be. He says, even of thy holy temple, verse five, by terrible things and righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God, our salvation. Who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are far off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast to mountains, being girded with power. You see, we talk about the terror of the problems that come in our lives, don't we? Like a raging sea, if it were. We talk about all of those things that come and rage out against us and the terrors that take hold of us in our lives and the fear and the trepidation that we have. But I want to tell you something. There is something greater to be feared than the sea that is at, at, that is at a state of unrest. It is the one who is the master of the sea. He's the greatest terror. The seas, the wind, and the waves, they obey his voice. He is a terror to the seas that he created. So therefore, when the terror of the sea rises up against us, we can come to the creator God, who's the terror of the sea, and he can make the water still. I want to ask you to look in Isaiah if you will, in the book of Isaiah in chapter 54. Isaiah says something about this in verse number 11. He says, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundation with sapphires and I will make thy windows of egg gates and the gates of carbuncles and the borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace. Do you see that? The peace of thy children. Yes, God can calm the raging sea. He could call the he could call the winds to a place of silence. He is our security. The disciples learned that. Then it goes on to talk about something else here. In verse 7, he says, What sitteth in the noise of the seas and the noise of their waves and the turmoil of the people, they also that dwell in the othermost part are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the mornings and the evenings to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and washed it. Thou greatly enriched it by the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast provided it for it. So what does he say here? And I, I'm amazing because I was amazed when I was reading and studying this. I began to think about the mountains that God has made and the tall peaks that all that men have tried to climb and 
the, the Matterhorn and all of these places, high elevations upon this earth that God has created. And we look at them and we say, wow, that's huge. And God looks down upon it and says, hey, there's a pebble there. You see, the mountains don't frighten God either. The winds and the rain and the and the snows and all of the things that happen and the threatening of those places where it seems like the pace is lost. God looks at them as tokens. He says they're just something there that I put there for for my own reasons, for my own design, for my own purpose. I've colored the earth, I've fashioned the earth, I've made the earth to work in a certain way. And they are tokens of my grace. They are tokens of my majesty. They are tokens of my creativity. And they are obedient to my every command. You know, when you start looking at things like that, you start looking at God with a new set of uh, glasses, don't you? new set of eyes. You start seeing a God who is majestic. You start seeing a God who is high, a God who is high and lifted up, who's holy. Do all things bid, do his bidding immediately as he bids it, except for man. Man is the only rebel. But you know there's coming a day when God will put the rebel at rest as well, won't he? Because he says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that I am God to the glory of God the Father. And they don't get away, we don't get away with it either. You see, it's amazing to me how everything in creation obeys God immediately, but man wants to think about it. <laughs> how silly is that? But notice what it says here. In spite of all of this that the psalmist is talking about here, as he's talking about worship and praise, as he's looking at God and seeing him as he is, he says God has provided for man in spite of his rebellion. He's given the water that man needs to produce the crops. He's given the corn that man needs to eat to sustain himself. He's giving them those things that they need out of the goodness of the Almighty. He wow that waters the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessed the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness. We can't even make a drop of rain, guys. That's the truth. We, we, this, this world, this place that, that we have, the vegetation we have, the, pro, the crops that we have, everything we have, we can't produce any of it. God Almighty in his goodness produced the rain. We can't even make one raindrop. Oh, we can take what he's already created and re, 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 do it to make it do something that we think we want it to do. But listen, when it comes to the thunder and the rain and the, the timing of the rain, the conditioning of the rain, all of the things that God sends our way to replenish this world that we live in, this earth that we are on for our needs and for our goodness and for our uh, ability to survive, all of those things come to us from the hand of the Almighty and not we ourselves. And so the psalmist is looking and seeing all the majesty and the magnificence of God and all that God is providing for and all that God is doing and everything that's happening in the realm of God for man. He says in verse 12, he says, they drop upon the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice on every side. You know, I'm reminded of what Jesus said in coming into the uh, uh, streets of Jerusalem as he was 
being coming against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and they were laying all these uh, palm leaves and all this down in the path as he came. And the Pharisees got upset and they got mad. And Jesus said, I'll tell you this, that if they didn't do these things, the rocks would cry out to God. And some people say, well, that was just something that Jesus was saying to illustrate that he could do that. I don't believe that at all. I believe the creator God could say to the rock, I want you to sing my praise, and the rock would sing it. Man might not, but the rock will. If God calls upon his creation to show his glory and his majesty and to sing his praise, it will happen. Why? Because he's a God Almighty. He's that kind of God. He's not wandering around out there hoping something good will happen. Oh, no. No, 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 no. He is God Almighty. He is the good one. He is the one that we fall on our face before and worship and cry out and seek his face. And the psalmist says it accurately here. They drop before the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with corn they shout for joy. They also sing. So when you look at all that God has done and the provision that God has given and the beauty of the world in which we live, how can you miss the majesty of Almighty God? How do you do that? I don't know. But this is what the psalmist is talking about here in Psalm chapter 65. He's talking about the magnitude of worshiping a God who is totally holy and who is before all things, who created all things, who sustains us where we are today and is coming back for us. Wow, what a glorious thing. No wonder we sing the songs of praise. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Lord, we love you. Love you with our whole being. God, we worship you and we honor you and we lift you up. Oh, God, help us to worship you like we should. Help us to love you like we should. Help us to walk in your ways, not because we have to, but because we love you. Help us to sing your praise because it's in our hearts and on our lips. God, help us to be truly yours in every moment of every day for every day that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen.